Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is February 21st, 2024. This is part four of A Warning to the Mountains of Israel. We saw in the last video that Job accuses God of injustice, that it, there's no reason to walk with him because what does it profit a man to take delight in God if God's going to do to him what God allowed to happen to Job. And then Elihu sums that thought up in verse uh, 23. He says, when, when such a man is like that, when, when such a man believes that God is not just, then he believes that God cannot even govern the world. And he says, God has no need to consider such a man further that he should even come before God in judgment. So that's that's a very serious word to Job at that point. But Elihu continues on in chapter 34, <clears throat> and it gets even more serious than that. Because at the very end of that chapter, he says in verse 34 of chapter 34, he says, Men of understanding will say to me, and the wise man who hears me will say, Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without insight. And then verse 36, would that Job were tried to the end. Oh, would that he did come before a judge and were tried to the end because he answers like wicked men. So now he's accusing Job of being wicked. But listen to this. The last verse of chapter 34, for he for he adds rebellion to his sin. He claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. He multiplies his words against God, and in doing that, he adds rebellion to his sin. Now, does that bring to mind a verse from 1 Samuel 15? Rebellion is as the sin of of witchcraft. You see, and that, that was dealing with King Saul in 2 Samuel 15. Saul lost his kingdom because he did not obey God's command to devote to destruction all of the Amalekites. And then Samuel told him that that rebellion was as the sin of witchcraft. Now we're going to take some time now to go to some very pertinent scriptures in the book of Deuteronomy. Where we'll, we're going to look at four words, no, eight words, that talk about witchcraft and the various aspects of witchcraft. Before we get to that, though, I want to bring something to your attention that you, you may or may not know. In the scripture, Saul is considered to be a type of the Pentecostal church. In other words, a type of the church that believes that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are really available and available to those in the Christian church. Remember when Saul was chosen to become king, a spirit of prophecy came upon Saul, and he prophesied. And someone asked, is Saul among the prophets? You know, one of the <clears throat> characteristics of the, the harlot church, and, and the entire church system today is a harlot, one of the characteristics of the harlot church is prophecy. Many people are proclaiming that they're apostles and they're prophets. And I have judged these apostles and prophets for years now, for 30 years, and they're all false. They never say anything that's true. Their prophecies fall to the ground, and they steal one another's words. And not only that, they deceive people with their prophecies. And that's exactly what Mike Bickle did. That's what Mike Bickle did for over 40 years. He used prophecy in order to seduce women 
in order to have sex with them. And then he used prophecy in order to seduce men so that they would obey him and think that they were really in the presence of a prophet, really in the presence of someone that God spoke to in amazing ways. But it was all false. It was all false prophecy. <clears throat> there is no fruit in IHOP. There is no fruit from Mike Bickle's ministry. Mike Bickle has committed the sin unto death that John talks about in chapter 5 of 1 John. People need to come to grips with what he has done and how serious his sins are. It's foolishness, it's utter foolishness for you people to say, what are we going to do? Well, how are we going to replace the mighty thing that IHOP did around the world? Who's going to pray 24 hours a day? What a joke. Pray for what? You can't hear the Spirit. You don't know what the Spirit wants you to pray about. You all were there feeding your flesh, indulging your flesh with beautiful sounding chords and notes from guitars and pianos and voices. I know, I've been there, I was there. My wife was on the worship team at Metro for four years. I'm a musician. I've written hundreds and hundreds of songs. I know what music is and I know what it does and I know how it makes you feel. I went to IHOP a couple of times at the beginning to see what was going on and very seductive. Very, very, very seductive. I will allure you. I will seduce you with the sound of the worship at IHOP. You'd never discerned the spirits there. And where's the fruit? Show me the fruit. What's the fruit of Mike Bickle's ministry? These poor women that lived, that have lived now for years, under the shadow of that, thinking that he truly repented when he told them he was sorry for what he did. And yet he was doing the same thing with other women. It's really so heinous that the full strength, the full gamut of that planned deception, planned deception of both leaders in his church men and women in his church, and then women that he wanted to sexually abuse. It's so planned. And you think he can be restored to ministry? He has sinned the sin unto death. He will take part in the second death. Now, I know you don't understand what the second death is yet. We're going now to examine from the book of Deuteronomy, exactly what this sin of witchcraft is. And it's the sin that Mike Bickle participated in. It's the sin that IHOP participated in. And it is the sin common to every charismatic church that I have ever gone to participates in. And I went to many. I went to at least 10 different ones that I was seeking God and seeking a place of fellowship, and God finally revealed to me, you're not gonna find the truth. You're not gonna find me in these dens of Satan, these synagogues of Satan. So let's look now at the book of Deuteronomy. But before we go there, why is this relevant to the mountains of Israel? Because you mountains of Israel, you overcomers, guard your heart, lest somebody seize your crown at the very last instant because you get puffed up in pride. Because God comes upon you with power and you suddenly think you're something we are nothing but his servant. I serve the living God. My will is to do his will. I only want to do what I see my father doing. 
I do not want to make a name for myself. I don't want to be like the people of Babel. I don't want to be like Lucifer. And I don't want to be like the king of Tyre. I want my father to give me my new name that he gives me. I do not want to make a name for myself. I do not want to raise myself above my God. And I certainly do not want to get involved in witchcraft. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to start with verse 9. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or anyone who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to I am. Now remember... I've been talking about the abomination of desolation that stands in the holy place. This is defining characteristics of that abomination of desolation. And we find that abomination of desolation within the hearts, within almost all hearts on earth right now, and certainly we find this abomination of desolation within those things that are called the church here on earth. Continuing in verse 12 of uh, Deuteronomy 18. And because of these abominations, I am your God is driving them out before you. Now, he was talking about natural nations, Canaanite nations at this time. But I'm saying to you today, God is driving out. God will soon drive out the abominations that we see in our churches and in our hearts. God is going to remove the abominations from our heart and he's going to remove the abominations from our midst among those who say that they serve him. Verse 13, you shall be blameless before I am your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess so overcomers, you shall be blameless before I am your God. For the world, the nations, all the nations of the world, which you overcomers are about to dispossess, they all listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, overcomer, I am your God. That word I am is the Lord the Tetragrammaton, the Lord, Yahuwah. I, it means I am because God is present. He is. I am your God has not allowed you to do this. We cannot be fortune tellers. We cannot be diviners. And that's what the prophets in today's churches are. I've seen it over and over and over. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to look at the specific words that we find in verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> in the English Standard Version, which I just read, the first word translated is translated divination. In the King James Version, the same word, divination. And now we're going to look at those particular words that the Lord would have us to understand. This word divination is the word that is translated witchcraft in the King James Version in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. The word is from the Hebrew word number 7081, which is, the Hebrew is pronounced kesem, and it means to cast a lot. <clears throat> and generally it's used to receive a fee for divining. To receive a fee for 
a, a an act of uh, divination, and it's what Balaam did when King of King Balak came to hire him to curse Israel. He received a fee for his divination. The second word that we want to look at is tells fortunes. It says tells fortunes in the English Standard Version and in the King James Version it is rendered an observer of times. That is from the Hebrew word number 6049 and it's pronounced anan and it means to cloud over, to act covertly, to practice magic. We live in a day of thick clouds. Darkness covers the earth. And that's because our time is characterized by this. We're living in a time of deep witchcraft, divination, telling fortunes. The third word is the word enchanter in the King James Version, <clears throat> and it's rendered interprets omens in the English Standard Version. It's from H5172, and it's the word nakash, which means to hiss, whisper, to whisper a magic spell. The fourth word is witch in King James Version, and it's sorcerer in the English Standard Version. It's from Hebrew word number 3784, pronounced kashaf. In the word kashaf, and I'm using my e-sword to find these out, both the number and uh, the pronunciation of the Hebrew word. Kashaf means to whisper a spell or to enchant or practice magic. The next word that we're going to is in Deuteronomy 18 verse 11. The word is charmer in both the King James Version and the English Standard Version. That is Hebrew word 2266, which is the word kabar. It means to join specifically by means of spells, to fascinate. The next word in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18, 11, consult her with familiar spirits in the King James Version. It's Hebrew word 7592. Sha'al or Sha'al, it means to inquire. But there's two words, so the second word of that is H178, which is a word O Ab or Obey. Properly, it means to mumble. And is thought to mean a necromancer. And that word is translated medium in the English Standard Version. The seventh word is translated wizard in the King James Version 
and Necromancer in, in the English Standard Version. It's from H3049. The word is pronounced Yede One, and it means a knowing one, a conjurer, or a ghost. And then the eighth word is translated Necromancer in the King James Version, and it's translated one who inquires of the dead in the English Standard Version. It's from the Hebrew word 1875, which is pronounced darash, and it means to seek, ask, or worship. It's combined with H413, the word L, which means that which is near or among you, and also from H4191, the word muth, which means to die or a dead body. And so, literally, Putting those three words together, it means to inquire of a dead body which is near you. This is the sin of the church today, which itself is a dead body. They think they're the body of Christ. The church believes it's the body of Christ, but they are a dead body. And these four or these eight words that we see, in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 10 and 11 describe the condition of the church this is where their power comes from it's false demonic power and it comes from inquiring of the dead on behalf of the living they do not inquire of the living for their people All that they do is built upon deception, lies, and trying to get what they want. Using, using the Word of God to make money. It is the same old story that we've heard for 2,000 years, like the church, the Catholic Church selling indulgences. In other words, you could plan to sin, and if you paid your local church, your priest, your bishop, your pope, enough money, they would give you an indulgence to sin. You just had to pay for it. That's how corrupt the church was then, and that's still how corrupt the church is today. So in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, Moses uses all eight of those words. And then in verse 12, he says, anyone who does any of those eight things is an abomination to the Lord, an abomination to I am. That word abomination is used in both the King James Version and the English Standard Version. It's from Hebrew number 8441, which is pronounced... Toeba, and it means something disgusting and abhorrent, especially through idolatry. God says it was specifically for these things and because of these sins that he is driving out the nations before Israel. And remember, the abomination of desolation. When you see the abomination of desolation, we see the abomination of desolation. Do you understand? Open your spiritual ears and understand where we are in time. Thus says I am. And for this cause, I am now driving out the church before my Kodeshim, before my holy ones. The abomination of desolation stands in the holy place. It stands in the very hearts of all those who say they lead my church, but I do not know them. They run here and there throughout the earth, and there they seek the living one amongst the dead. I now discard what men call the church of God. I discard them as a man discards a worthless branch. Now my true branch, 
my righteous branch shall arise with healing in his wings.